Renewable electricity is the energy of the future. So, let's just switch. Or... Welcome to watch the sustainability trends in business. In this episode, we will look into the implications of renewables in the electrical grid. Producing electricity used to be very easy. If you needed more electricity, you just used more coal. Low fixed cost, high variable cost. Stable and predictable price for the future. As coal is widely available, even geopolitical hassle doesn't impact it so much because you can buy it from many sources. Now what we have is high capital cost, low variable cost, stochastic, that is random, weather dependent production forms, renewables, and they have truly changed the game. Combining this randomness with inflexibility has consequences. Let's look at the electricity price in Nordpool FI during the last 12 months. Please note that the y-axis is not linear here. It's compressed because the dynamic range is so huge. It's from minus 500 euros per megawatt hour to over 2500 euros a megawatt hour. Well here the price looks quite random and it looks quite high. But this is partly optics. First of all, the average price over this 12 month period over the year is only 52 euros per megawatt hour. Not that much. So if you are using a 24-7 base load using the same amount of electricity all the time, it's a bumpy ride, yes, but it's not very expensive. It's actually one of the least expensive in the EU, probably the second uh, least expensive out of Sweden due to large penetration of renewables. So we have wind, we have solar and we have hydro to thank for this. If all the hours of a year, in this case 366 days, that is 8784 hours, are ordered by price, we will get a curve like this. Again, please, compressed y-axis, beware. And now from this curve you can see that the median price is at 50%. It is 34 euros per megawatt hour, which means that half of the time the spot price is below 34 euros a megawatt hour. If you look at the same curve at 10%, so the lowest decile, then the price is zero or negative. To further emphasize this, let's draw another curve. Now a linear scale. This is the average price for certain percentage of cheapest hours. So for example, if you look at 50%, it means that you would have used the 50 cheapest percent of hours during that year. So for 1,300 something hours. And the average for those hours is only 12 euros per megawatt hour. So if you have something that can use electricity only half of the year and you can choose the hours freely then you only pay 12 euros megawatt hour that's dirt cheap and if you take the cheapest 20 percent of year's hours the average price is minus two euros per megawatt hour you will get paid for using electricity of course very few loads are that flexible you want to switch on the lights in the evening in January, you won't shift it to midday in June. We will get back to this a bit later on, but the question when is extremely important when it comes to electricity consumption. It is important both from the grid point of view and from the carbon emission point of view. And of course that reflects into the user's wallet. Why is the price fluctuating? Well, of course, due to inflexible demand and supply curves, we know that they are almost vertical at some point. And wind is here the major culprit on the production side. Here we have two curves, electricity price and wind power production. Now we have a linear y-axis, but it doesn't show the most expensive hours. The graph on the right combines these two. So there is a spot, a dot for each hour of the year on the right. Furthermore, different months have different colors in the graph so that you can actually see how change, seasons change and impact the price. So now as we go from autumn to winter, the prices fluctuate a lot. There is a decent amount of wind, 
cheap prices, but then also calm periods of very high prices. And it really looks quite random. But it's good to remember that this is uh, winter 23-24, which had cold spells, and it was a bit cooler than an average winter. At least it was not an easy winter from the energy point of view. If you look at the graph on the right, there is less randomness. The price is never very high when it's windy, on the right, and it's mostly well below 50 euros per megawatt hour, even when it's windy in the winter. High prices occur only when there is little wind. While the prices are much lower in general in summer, the trend is the same. There is a strong negative correlation between windiness and electricity price. This may be good news for consumers, if you can time your consumption, but it's very bad news for wind producers. The average price or the average value of wind is 35 euros a megawatt hour, a third less than the overall average of 52. To understand how this works, let's look at how much is produced with each production method and what the average value of electricity sold is. Let's start from the fossils, coal, gas and peat. They could also be called the valuables. And here we also have the other renewables, which is probably biogas. It's quite negligible in size, though. So the fossils have a lot of value, almost 100 euros a megawatt hour. But running fossils is expensive due to emission cost. So it makes sense that they are only used when the price is high. Actually, the emissions trading is working here. Yay! And also another thing is that fossils are often used in CHP, a combined uh, heat and power production during the winter when we need a lot of district heating and then the producer capture value also from the heat not only from producing electricity by fossils because at this price level it wouldn't be worth it trying to uh, only make electricity out of coal for example. Well then we have hydro. We have a lot of hydro actually in Finland and it's a gold mine. It has very low running cost, very very low running cost and very high value. I would love to own a hydroelectric power plant. So it's very good for the grid to fill in the other renewables. It's a win-win, but it's also a windfall due to uh, site monopoly, which means that you can't actually build new hydroelectric power plants because all the rivers which you can use are already used. So if you happen to have it, good for you. If you don't, it's not scalable. Well, then we have other waste and biomass. They are mostly uh, industrial and combined heat and power fuels. As CHP runs mostly during the winter, of course, when we need heat, the value is higher than average. Then we have nuclear. Again, we have a lot of nuclear, actually, almost 40%. And it's very close to average. Well, this, is, this kind of makes sense because nuclear is producing the same amount of electricity all the time unless you have some maintenance breaks. So it should be exactly the average, but because uh, nuclear units are so large, whenever you have a maintenance break, that tends to increase the price. So when you don't have nuclear, the price is a bit higher. But it's very close to average anyway. And then we have scalable renewables. They are cheaper, or the value is smaller. Solar is not that big, but at less than 40 euros per megawatt hour, it's also much cheaper than average. Uh, of course, the production is during daytime in summer, um, so that makes it, of course, the production cost is low as well, so this is not that bad. But wind is the worst. Wind projects have been planned with 50 to 60 euros per megawatt hour. Now, wind producers are getting 35 euros per megawatt hour. So it's sort of a poor investment and something has to happen to facilitate further scaling. Of course, the customer's perspective is different. Renewables lower electricity price. Whatever you put on the right side of the graph will lower the average price. The more, the merrier. What can we do about it? The problem is temporal correlation. So we have a lot of production of the same type at the same moment. When it's windy, all the wind turbines are producing electricity. When it's sunny, all the solar panels are producing electricity. Of course, these uh, explanations before they omit e exports and imports, which are important, but they are also a complex issue and they don't fix it all, at least not in the future. The temporal correlation of solar is difficult. East-west distribution helps a bit because you get 
maybe half an hour before you have on the on the west coast you have uh, 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 on the east side of the country you have sun half an hour before the west coast it helps a bit but only that half an hour uh, clouds, clouds are not so much a problem uh, if you have different locations because then you have different weathers and different uh, locations but the difference between summer and winter still is a huge challenge and during the night no power with wind geographic distribution would also help somewhat now most production is concentrated in a small area because it's a windy area and because there are other reasons why we can't put them close to the Russian board offshore wind will also help because it's windier on the sea but these are small streams uh, we can help it a bit, but then the big thing is demand flexibility. And as shown before, the demand is extremely inflexible at the moment. As a practical example, sort of a small one, I show the consumption pattern of my own home. Uh, we have district heating, so there is no heating consumption here, but there are two battery electric vehicles in the household, which are mostly charged at home contributing a lot to the uh, power consumption. And this is the quarter hourly average electricity consumption for the year. It doesn't make much sense, does it? Looks spiky, but let's zoom in and have a look at the holiday week with no one at home. Now here you can see that it's about 350 watts in average. Basically what we have fridge, freezer and ventilation, not much more. And in comparison, when everyone is at home, another random week, the pattern looks like this. So there are small peaks due to cooking, laundry, vacuuming, boiling water, and so on. That's what we call the everyday life. However, if we change the vertical scale, you can notice there is a big peak here, and that is electric vehicle charging. 11 kilowatt charger. While cooking needs to be done when someone is hungry, vacuuming needs to be done when someone does it. EV charging is flexible. It can be usually done during the night, that's actually quite handy, and it doesn't usually need to be done tonight, it can be done next night or the night after or the night after, sometimes this week. So let's get back to the big picture. All these spikes are EV charging. And now if we correlate my domestic consumption with the electricity price, the result is here. Unfortunately, I don't have separate metering for the cars, so I'll just assume that everything about 5 kilowatts represents car charging. That's close enough. There is a small error due to sauna and so on, but it's really a small one. So what does this mean price-wise? Well, the average market price has been 52 euros per megawatt hour during the period of time. The average time I have paid has been 34 euros per megawatt hour. It's nicely less, about one third less. But when we split this into the basic domestic consumption, that fridge freezer department, uh, that is actually at 52 euros per megawatt hour. So exactly the average market price as expected. And then we have EV charging at 15 euros per megawatt hour. This means that the average uh, tax margin transmission free energy cost is 27 cents per 100 kilometers. 27 cents per 100 kilometers. That rounds down to zero. Of course, the real price is around sixfold due to taxes, transmission, and so on, but it's still under two cents per kilometer. And again, that's something I'd call dirt cheap, and it's not a good thing. But let's discuss that later. Of course, Battery electric vehicles are not that common yet, but they are becoming more common. Building heating is another large opportunity. Heating can be transferred from one hour to another quite easily. In some cases, this may be 10 hours or more. What we need is incentives that might be spot-priced electricity and automation and services. It's not a human thing to sit there and check the electricity price all the time and press buttons. You need to have automation and systems to do that. Uh, it's not feasible to think people will spend their time looking at the electricity price and worrying about it. So this is good from the business point of view because there is a lot of room for demand flexibility services. There is also a lot of room for demand flexibility in industry as well. The most energy intensive processes of course try to do this already because energy is a huge cost. If you pay millions for your electricity, you 
bloody well take care that you're doing it in a bright way. But the middle ground is large. So this is the largest economic shift caused by the sustainability transition, which means that there is a lot of business. If you need to use energy when it's expensive, you will be in trouble. If you can use electricity when it's cheap, you will win. At the same time, this is a good thing because if you use the electricity when it's cheap, you increase the profitability of renewables and thus facilitate the transition. So it's really a win-win. It's not only about electrification, it's also about flexibility. So large part of the trillions we're globally going to use into the transition will be needed to do this, flexibility and electrification. Of course, this is the demand side, but the holy grail of scaling renewables and providing a reasonably steady energy supply is storing energy. But we will talk about that in the next episode. See you then.